Welcome to Books and Sound. I'm your host, Don Beavers, and this episode contains a digitally remastered theatrical presentation of one of the great works of literature. Please remember to subscribe so that you can enjoy new episodes as they are released. This podcast is provided free and offered without commercial interruption. If you enjoy the episode, please leave us a positive review so that we can grow the podcast. Enjoy. This is the NBC Theater. From the NBC Theater in Hollywood, a radio first, an hour-length dramatization of one of the major works of Thomas Wolfe, You Can't Go Home Again, prepared for radio by Clarice A. Ross of NBC. At intermission, a recorded commentary on the writings of Thomas Wolfe by the distinguished editor of the Saturday Review of Literature, Mr. Norman Cousins. To the works of Thomas Wolfe, the adjectives formless, undisciplined, overwritten, have all been applied at various times. In his novels, you find not so much a story as a great and detailed impression of people, times, and places. Wolfe recorded everything. In our presentation of You Can't Go Home Again, we do not propose to try to bring you the entire book nor any connected plot. Rather, we wish to bring you as fully as possible the real flavor of certain major portions of the book. Those portions examining several of the components of a man's life, to which, as Wolf and his hero discover, you can't go home again. When George Weber turned at last to examine everything he knew... Everything he had learned, he found that it all led to a decision which was the hardest he ever had to make. For nine years, since the publication of his first book, his dearest friend had been his editor, Fox Edwards. His dearest friend and the father of his spirit. And now he knew that the time had come to leave Fox Edwards. And George sat down and wrote to Fox. He wrote many things. But mostly a record of what he had looked for and what he had found. And what he had found was that you can't go home again. You can't go home to your family, home to your childhood, home to romantic love, home to a young man's dreams of glory and of fame, home to exile in some foreign land, home to the old forms and systems of things which once seemed everlasting, home to the escapes of time and memory. And so he wrote... You may think it a little premature of me to start summing up my life at the age of 37. But believe me, it is not egotism that prompts me to do this. My whole experience swings round as though through a predestined orbit to you, to this moment, to this parting. So bear with me, and then farewell. You can't go back to your family, back home to your childhood. Forgotten memories returned to me, old songs, old faces. I wandered in many lands and cities, and yet I felt the magnetic pull of home. And why? Why, if it did not matter? And if this little town and the immortal hills around it were not the only home I had on earth? Your Aunt Maud died last night. Stop. Funeral Thursday in Libya Hill. Stop. Come home if you can. Mayor Kennedy, it's been a long time. Uh, it has, boy. How are you? Sorry to hear about your aunt. She was a good woman, George, a good woman. Yes. Oh, uh, you won't know Libya Hill. No, sir. Things are booming down our way. Property on Market Street going for 5000 up front foot. Market Street? The building's all dumps, of course. Folks are paying for the land. Pretty good for Libya Hill, eh? It was a nice, sleepy little mountain town. I was hoping it would be the same. What are you saying, boy? Why, Libby Hill's going to be the largest and most beautiful city in the state. You mark my word. Something had happened to the past. What was it? Now in the train, another face, another voice. Judge Rumford Blake, Bland, of Libya Hill. Old and evil and corrupt. Died and stained with evil through his blood, his bone, his flesh... 
Blind, corrupt, evil old man. Good evening, Weber. Oh, Judge Bland. Sit down, son. Let the dead bury their dead. Come, sit among the blind. Oh, I, uh, there are a lot of people on the train from home, Judge. Mayor Kennedy yes, and Parson... Yes, I know. As eminent a set of stinking rats as were ever gathered together within the narrow confines of a Pullman car. <clears throat> How the folks... Oh, I... Aunt Ma's dead. I'm going home to the funeral. Dead, is she? So you're going down to bury her. And do you think you can go home again? What? Well, how do you mean? Answer me. Do you think you can? Why, yes, I... Look here, Judge Bland, I haven't done anything. <laughs> you sure? <laughs> the guilty fleeth where no man pursueth, son. I heard you, Kennedy, and you, Parson Flack and Banker Riggs. Remember when Bland did this and that? Remember what? Remember Banker Riggs when you established the fastest growing bank in the state and weren't too particular what it grew on? Remember, Parson, how you've run the town all these years? A very nice little private business, isn't it, Parson? Remember. George, boy, I've been a giddy fellow. I've spent my talents in riotous living. All the forms of hellishness that saintly fellows who go to prayer meeting know nothing of. Oh, I'll warm my old age with the memories of my own sinfulness. But I also remember other things. And maybe in my humble sphere, I too have served a purpose of being the wild oat of the more worthy citizens. Mm. <laughs> Goodbye, son. Don't forget I tried to warn you. How are you, boy? Put it there. Oh, Randy <laughs> and Margaret. How are you, Margaret? Well, George, you haven't changed a bit since you and Randy were boys together. <laughs> a little stouter, but I reckon I'd have known you. <laughs> oh, George, it's good to see you, boy. But you'll get it now. Get what? Oh, all hours from daybreak to three in the morning. No holes barred. They'll be waiting for you. Who? <laughs> Who? <laughs> Why, every dang mountain grill of a real estate agent in town. Horseface Barnes, Skin em Alive Judson, the winner orphan man from Arkansas. Why, oh, they'll be drawing lots by now to see which one gets your shirt and which one takes the pants and BVDs. <laughs> The very streets that he had known so well and remembered through the years, in their early afternoon emptiness and drowsy lethargy, were foaming with life. And there was a look on people's faces, a nervous, excited glitter, a secret, an unholy glee. Listen, George, you're going to be a $2,000 a year school teacher all your life. There are worse things than being a school teacher, Sam. You really get that $2,000. It's real. It's not real estate money, you know. You, you can buy a ham sandwich with it. <laughs> <laughs> you're all right, George. Uh, George, that house of your uncle's on Locust Street, would he consider an offer? Would he take a hundred thousand? Well, can you get it for him? Within 24 hours. Tell you what I'll do. You persuade him to sell, and I'll split the commission with you. I'll give you five thousand dollars. It's a go, Sam. But, uh, could you let me have fifty cents on account? Oh, make him sell, boy. What's the use of keeping it? Thousands in every deal. Never heard of anything like it. Lord, Lord, what are we coming to? <laughs> What were they coming to? The better life, of course. It was all they talked about. They leveled hills and bored through mountains, making tunnels that leapt out on the other side into wilderness. They flung away the earnings of a lifetime, ruined their city, themselves, their children, and their children's children. So you've written a book, Mr. Weber. What's it about? Why, uh... Why, I hardly know. It's a novel. Oh, uh, anything to do with this part of the country? Why... Well, it's about the South, all right, but it could take... A local boy writes romance of the old South. Uh, Mr. Webber, you've been to uh, Europe several times. How does this section of the country compare with other places you've seen? Why, uh, 
Well, good. I mean, fine. Uh, you see, that is... Local paradise tops everything. Say, do you ever think of coming back here to live? Why, uh, well, I have thought of it, but you see, huh? if I... Famous author will settle and build here. Uh, Mr. Webber, do you uh, intend to write another book? Well, I hope so. In fact, I... Ah, been... Now, don't be so bashful, Mr. Webber. Say, you know what you ought to do? You ought to come back here and do for the section what Longfellow did for New England. Author plans native saga. I have in mind a trilogy tracing the steady progress of Libya Hill from its foundings right down to its present international prominence and the proud place it occupies as the gem city of the hills. The fools, the fools! Flowers look beautiful on the grave. I never did think you'd be so sentimental, George. Well, Margaret, I just thought I'd come up here and say goodbye to, to the place. Margaret, what's going to happen to this town, to all these people? Why, nothing, George. What can happen? There's a hunger for death here. I can feel it. This boom, this lunacy, these paper profits... What are they looking for? Oh, I'm not clever like you are, George. I don't know. I remember this town the way it used to be. At night, the desolation, the monotony. The hope that somewhere there was a secret, rich, and more abundant life. They never found it, the famished men. The famished men wandering in the dark. I'll vow, George. I don't know what you're saying. Never heard of any man wandering around in the dark in this town, unless maybe Judge Bland. Judge Bland. Perhaps he's the key to the whole thing. Perhaps he looked for something better, a joy and a beauty that he never found. Perhaps he's lived his life in shame because there was no work for the goodness in him, no place here for curiosity and intelligence and hope. He said something to me on the train coming down. He said... You can't go home again. I wonder if that was what he meant. Down by the river's edge, George Weber heard the bell, the whistle, and the pounding wheel of the night express, with its triumphant promise of morning, new lands, and a shining city. And something in his heart was saying, like a whisper, speaking of flight, soon, soon, soon. The town of my childhood was lost, nothing to remind one of the liquid leather shuffle in the quiet streets at noon when the men came home to lunch and of laughter and low voices in the leafy rustle of the night. All this was lost. You can't go home again. You can't go home to your family, home to your childhood, home to romantic love, home to... Love is enough, though the world be waning, wrote William Morris. Perhaps it was true for him, yet I doubt it. As for myself, I did not find it so. Even while I was most securely caught up and enclosed within the inner circle of love's bondage, I began to discover a larger world outside. It came upon me little by little, almost without my knowing it. I should never have tried to come back to her. She was older than I, married, living with her husband and her grown daughter. But I loved her, don't you see? Oh, George, isn't it awful? Have you come to where it says, Miss Esther Jack, whose work has won her recognition as one of the foremost designers in the modern theater? Oh, George, isn't it awful? You're reveling in it, and you know it. 
the excellent fooling that is implicit in these droll settings. Elvishly sly, mocking, and, need we add, expert. <laughs> Charlie, oh. you should see your face. Elvishly sly. Now, isn't that too delightful? Why, that quaint little jerk. These droll settings. Oh, I am swooning, sweetheart. Pass the garlic. I didn't write it. <laughs> I can't help it if they write things like that. You know these theater critics. Well, do I get fed or must I starve here while you wallow in this bilge? I am not wallowing. You're laughing it up. You're gloating over it. <laughs> Woman, do you know I haven't had a bite to eat all day? Now, do I get fed or not? Will you put your excellent fooling in a state? Yes. Is that what you'd like? Will you make me one of your droll and expert sauces? Oh, yes. Whatever you like, I will make it for you. Why will you make it for me? Because I love you. Because I want to feed you and to love you. Will it be good? It will be so good that there will be no words to tell its goodness. It will be so good because I can do everything better than any other woman you will ever know... And because I love you with all my heart and soul. Then this would be such food as no one ever ate before. Oh, yes, George. Yes, darling, it will be. George, you do love me, don't you, George? Yes, of course I do. Will you never leave me? Don't ask me things like that. I've told you I love you. I've also told you I've got to be free to live my life and do my work. You know that, don't you? Yes, darling, I know. You hear it, but do you know it? George, you will keep loving me forever, won't you? Forever? Please, George, I need to know. Will you... Keep on loving me forever. Look out there. Where? Across the street in that warehouse window. Oh, was he there again? George, why does he sit like that? Never changing his expression, never moving. Who is he, George? What is he? He's forever. There's your forever. <laughs> Why does the man sit in the window, his eyes calm and sorrowful, his face like the face of darkness and of time, as though it would speak with the voice of the whole earth, with a tired and sorrowful joy, with the knowledge of all tongues? O oh, brother, son, and comrade, we who have savored the tumult, the pain, and the frenzy, and now sit quietly by our windows, we call upon you to take heart, for we can swear to you that these things pass. But some things will never change. Lean down your ear upon the earth and listen. The voice of forest water, a woman's laughter in the dark, the cricketing stitch of midday in hot meadows. These things will never change. The glitter of sunlight on roughened water, the innocence of morning, the thorn of spring, the sharp and tongueless cry... These things will always be the same. Pain and death will also always be the same. But under the pavements trembling like a pulse, under the buildings trembling like a cry, under the hoof of the beast, there will be something growing like a flower, something bursting from the earth again, forever deathless, faithful, coming into life again like April. I won't do it, Esther. There's no use in trying to mix our two worlds. They're different, that's all. But it's going to be such a nice party, dear. Why, some of the most wonderful people in town will be there. Oh, please, George. I don't care who's going to be there. I've got work to do. Honestly, George, once you get an idea in your head, you hang on to it in the face of reason itself. Now, really, how can you be a writer and take no part in life? 
Listen to me, George. I don't ask much of you, but come to my party just to please me. All right, Esther. All right, all right. I'll go. I had thought love was the whole universe. And then I saw certain things in life, the great, the rich, the fortunate ones of earth, taking the very best for granted as their right, and the submerged and forgotten helots down below. Go on, get out of here, you panhandling bum. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Go on, get yourself a job like a man. What's wrong, John? Ah, these bums always hanging around. They got no right to bother the kind of people we got in this building. Yeah. Nah, it looks like a busy night tonight. Yeah, you better get yourself over to the front elevator. It goes off in five minutes, and Mrs. Jack's party will be starting. Mm. If I've carried up one package tonight, I've carried up 50. Now, that'll be the Jack's cook buzzing again. Them and their big parties. I'm coming, I'm coming. Hey, John, if you want a date after work tonight, I got it all fixed up with a couple of hot blondes. How about it, huh? You get out of here, Herbert. Get in the elevator and get your mind off women. Ah. Uh, if you ever had a blonde, you wouldn't know what to do with her. I'm coming, I'm coming, will you? Good Lord, what did I come here for? George, oh, George, darling, you're here. I'm so glad. I was so afraid you were going to fail Esther, me. Esther, I'm leaving. What's this mob got to do with me? George, you can't. Not after you promised. Oh, darling, I- I'm sure you're going to have a good time. I planned everything especially for you. Go and have a good time, darling. I, I want you to meet everybody. Oh, oh, Jay, Jay, how good to see you. I thought you were still here. Beautiful women with satiny backs, people laughing and chattering, white and black and gold and power and wealth and loveliness. The privileged of the earth, taking the very best for granted as their right, a law ordained of nature that they should be life's favorite children. These people were an honored group. They had stolen no man's ox or ass. They espoused all the right causes, if only the issue were fashionable. It was all suddenly clear to George Weber what he had meant when he spoke to Esther about her world and his own. He saw that the world of fashion and of privilege was the deadliest enemy of art and truth, that he could never sing America if he entered this special corner of mankind, that he must leave Esther... Or lose himself. Darling, you look so strange. Are you all right? Who said I wasn't all right? Why shouldn't I be all right? The party was almost over when the fire broke out. Excitedly, the dwellers in the great and fashionable building filed down into the street, watched the firemen fight and win against the flames and file back in again. No one was injured. I began to be conscious of the submerged and forgotten helots down below, who with their toil and sweat and blood and suffering unutterable, supported and nourished the mighty princelings at the top. No one was injured except that George Weber, standing in a nearby drugstore, heard a reporter phoning in his findings to the city desk. Nah, just the two of them. Both elevator men. John N. Borg, age 64, of Jamaica, Queens... And Herbert Anderson, age 25, Southern Boulevard, the Bronx. Yeah, they was both on the elevators trying to get the tenants out, and somebody pulled the wrong switch and trapped them between floors. Nah, nobody knows. Management's keeping it quiet. Want me to stick around, Mac? Okay. Darling, come sit here beside me. Hmm. George, hmm? wasn't it all strange? The party and the fire? Yes. Ah, well, what does it matter? Everything's over. There's nothing left but us. Do you know, I think about you all the time. Do you know, I I once tried to write a story about you. Did I ever tell you? No, tell me. Oh, I was ready to burst with it. 
But when I tried to write it, all I could say was, long, long into the night I lay, thinking of you. <laughs> I, I couldn't write anymore. But that one line keeps haunting me. Because that's the story. Oh, dearest, that's the whole story. In the whole world, there's nothing more. Love is enough. Tomorrow I will tell her. Not tonight, but tomorrow. And it would be better if I did not tell her that I love her still, that I will always love her. If she knew that, she would never understand. Never understand tomorrow. That a tide was running in the hearts of men. And I must go. Love was not enough. There had to be a larger world. And to reach it, there had to be honesty, sincerity, and no compromise with truth. From Hollywood, the NBC Theater is bringing you a radio version of You Can't Go Home Again by Thomas Wolfe, featuring Marvin Miller as George Weber. If you're interested in supplementing your enjoyment of these NBC Theater productions with home study under college supervision, be sure to listen to the announcement at the close of this program. And now, our intermission commentator, Mr. Norman Cousins. If you were to go around the colleges of America and talk to young people... And if you were to ask them the name of their favorite novelist, I suppose that the one name standing out far ahead of all the rest would be the name of Thomas Wolfe. I have a hunch that you would get the same answer if you spoke to young writers. There's a good reason why this is so. A good reason why Thomas Wolfe today is fast becoming a legend among young people. Why he should enjoy the deep affection, and in many cases the worship, of young writers. These reasons are made dramatically clear. And you can't go home again. The last of Thomas Wolfe's major novels. There is deep honesty here, a deep sense of purpose, a luminous integrity, an inspiring sensitivity, and a magnificent awareness of the endless combinations of colors in life. For Wolfe had an insatiable hunger to learn about life, about people, and about the problems of people. He wasn't afraid to think in print. He broke sharply from the literary tradition of the Hemingways with their clipped, staccato style of writing and thinking, Wolfe could address himself to the thoughts and feelings and hopes and people, to the struggles that went on inside them, to their search for values. In what is perhaps one of the most meaningful and magnificent passages in contemporary literature, he could write, and you can't go home again, it is for now and for us the living that we must speak and speak the truth, as much of it as we can see and know. With the courage of the truth within us, we shall meet the enemy as they come to us, and they shall be ours. And if, once having conquered them, new enemies approach, we shall meet them from that point, from there proceed. In the affirmation of that fact is man's religion and his living faith. These values of Thomas Wolfe can give inspiration to an ideal hungry younger generation. The shiny surfacey enthusiasm of the 20s, and the bitter disillusion of the 30s gave way to the search for purpose and ideals in the 1940s. Thomas Wolfe's books were published during the 30s, but they anticipated the needs of a generation that came of age during World War II. As a novelist, Thomas Wolfe was almost an encyclopedia of what not to do. In his books, what seemed to start out as the main trunk of a story would go rambling off into branches and yet other branches until the trunk was all but lost. There was almost no story structure or novel continuity. Yet, if we think of Wolfe, not as a novelist, but as an autobiographical dramatist, as an interpreter of inner conflict in man, as a sensitive observer of a fast-changing world, then his true claim to literary greatness will be firm and unchallenged. Thank you, Mr. Cousins. Our radio version of You Can't Go Home Again will continue from Hollywood after a brief pause for station identification.
You can't go home again. You can't go home to your family, home to your childhood, home to romantic love. Home to a young man's dreams of glory and of fame. Home to... I was enamored of that fair Medusa, Fame. All the guises of Fame's loveliness I had dreamed of since my early youth. I had wanted to be loved and to be famous. I had known love, but Fame was still elusive. And in the end, I had to have her. George Weber's novel... Home to Our Mountains, was published in November 1929. In writing it, he had drawn upon the experience of his own life. He had written about his hometown, about his family, and the people he had known. That was what caused the trouble. He tried to tell the truth about the little segment of life that he had seen and known. His book took the hide off the whole community, and as a result, it also took the hide off George Weber. Hello, Margaret. Uh, have you seen George's book? Why, yes, Harley. George sent me an advance copy, and he signed it for me, too, but I haven't read it. Have you seen it? Oh, uh, uh, yes. We we get a review copy at the newspaper office. Well, what do you think of it? I mean, well, now, you've been to college, Harley. You're, well, you're educated. You ought to be a judge about these things. But what I mean is, do you think it's good? Uh, uh, Margaret, it's pretty rough. Rough? What does that mean? Oh, no, no, no. Don't get excited. There's no use... Getting excited about it, but there are some pretty rough things in it. Uh, it's pretty frank, Margaret. About uh, about me? About me, oh, Harley? Not, not only about you, Margaret, about everybody in town. Uh, some of it's going to be pretty hard to take. Well, I'm sure I don't know what he's got to say about me. Well, now, if anyone feels that way... Well, I sir. And in the end, I had to have her. George Weber's novel... Home to Our Mountains, was published in November 1929. In writing it, he had drawn upon the experience of his own life. He had written about his hometown, about his family, and the people he had known. That was what caused the trouble. He tried to tell the truth about the little segment of life that he had seen and known. His book took the hide off the whole community, and as a result, it also took the hide off George Weber. Hello, Margaret. Uh, have you seen George's book? Why, yes, Harley. George sent me an advance copy, and he signed it for me, too, but I haven't read it. Have you seen it? Oh, uh, uh, yes. We we get a review copy at the newspaper office. Well, what do you think of it? I mean, well, now, you've been to college, Harley. You're, well, you're educated. You ought to be a judge about these things. But what I mean is, do you think it's good? Uh, uh, Margaret, it's pretty rough. Rough? What does that mean? Oh, no, no, no. Don't get excited. There's no use... Getting excited about it, but there are some pretty rough things in it. Uh, it's pretty frank, Margaret. About uh, about me? About me, oh, Harley? Not, not only about uh, you, Margaret, about everybody in town. Uh, some of it's going to be pretty hard to take. Well, I'm sure I don't know what he's got to say about me. Well, now, if anyone feels that way... Well, I certainly haven't got anything to be ashamed oh, of. I, kn- I know, Margaret, but um, there's going to be some Talk? Talk? Why, he can go right ahead and criticize me if he wants to. He, Why, I, I've lived all my life in this town. Everybody knows I've never done anything immoral. I certainly don't know what he... Harley. Harley, is it bad? It, it's pretty bad, Margaret. Uh, but don't worry, we'll just have to wait and see. <laughs> Well, author, your so-called literary book arrived. Your dear friend Margaret Shepperton, who has always been like a sister to you, is ruined for life. You have made her out no better than a wanton woman. You have disgraced your friends. Never come back here. You are the same as dead to all of us. If I saw a mob drag that monkeyfied carcass of yours across the square, I would not say a word. For weeks I have waited for the moment when your book would come and I would have it in my hands. And now what is there to say? 
You have laid waste the lives of your kinsmen. You have driven a dagger to the heart and left it fixed there where it must always stay. We'll kill you if you ever come back here. Signed, you know who. You have crucified us like Christ on the cross. If I had known you were going to write this kind of book, I could have told you lots of things. I know dirt about the people in this town that you never dreamed of. (laughs) In New York, George's book received a somewhat better reception than at home. In fact, he began to make all kinds of new and fabulous friends. This, then, was fame at last. My boy, it was wonderful of you to come to my little party. Wonderful. Oh, it was nice of you to invite me, Mr. Oh, Roy. call me Peyton, son, and don't thank me. Uh-huh. I ask myself, why does a man have money except to help the young, the deserving, and the brilliant, eh? Well, I wouldn't say oh, I Oh, it's would... intolerable, George. Intolerable. Did I hear them say you teach school? Intolerable. Couldn't happen anywhere but in America. I'll be back from this trip to Europe in a month, and I'm going to see that things are done for you. Whatever you want, George, just let me know. Peyton! Peyton! Well, well, it's our writer friend. How are you? Why, just fine. I, I... Say, I was mighty sorry when I read about it in the paper. Read what in the paper? Why, the prize. You didn't get it. What prize? The Pulitzer Prize. They gave it to another man. Well, nice to have seen you, Weber. You must look me up sometime. So much for his friend, the millionaire. Yet, let no one say that George was bitter. And then there was Dorothy. Dorothy was a beautiful and rich young widow, and her husband was recently dead. Oh, Algin. Algie, it's all for you, Algie. Come back to me. George. Oh, George, my poor boy, don't go. You just don't understand. I want to be so good to you. Everything I do or think or feel is Algernon. Algernon, Algernon. It was very fine and high and rare, and George Weber went away. He knew he was not fine enough. Yet not for a moment should you think that he was bitter. And then there was another girl, and her he understood. George, oh, George, darling, don't go. But look at the time. What does it matter? There is no time when we're together. Does it seem like only two weeks that we've known each other? No, oh, darling. Seems as though I'd known you all my life. Oh, yes, yes, George, yes. That's the way it is for me, too. Oh, darling, put your arms around me. Like this? Yes, George. Will you do one little thing for me if I ask you to? Oh, darling, anything. Anything you ask me if I can. I want you to use your influence to get me into the Cosmopolis Club. Dawn came and the stars fell. And yet he would not have it thought that he was bitter. Dear Randy... What is it that I have done? I have moments when I feel I would give my life if I could unwrite my book, unprint its pages. What has it accomplished except to ruin my relatives, my friends, and everyone in Libya Hill whose life was ever linked with mine? Have I really acted according to some inner truth and necessity? Or did my unhappy mother give birth to a perverse monster who has defiled the dead and betrayed the human race? I feel like a dead leaf in a hurricane. I don't know where to turn. Write me. Tell me what you think. Yours ever, George. Well, 
What do you want? What kind of an hour in the morning? <laughs> well, I'll be... Randy! Hold on, George, don't you? Well, I'll be. Come on, man, don't just stand there. <laughs> oh, I thought I'd come up and find out what was eating on you, boy. <laughs> well, this is this is quite a place you've hold yourself up into. Well, I've been working. He here, just clear off a chair and sit down. <laughs> How, how How is everybody? Oh, everybody's in a daze. The bank failing and Mayor Kennedy committing suicide. Uh, they don't know what hit him. You must have read all about it in the papers. Yeah, I did. Pretty bad, huh? Mm, very bad. And what are they saying now? About what? About me, about my book. Oh. Randy, those letters I got, they almost killed me. Isn't there anybody there who cares about the book itself? Anybody who understands what I was trying to do? I should think you'd know more about that than anyone. All right, then. Small two-timing bunch of crooked jackasses. They've done their best to ruin me. That's always the fate of the real artist. He gets driven out by the tribe. George, of all the people I have ever known, you are the least qualified to play the wounded fawn. Huh? What's the matter with you, boy? Stop ranting. You drove yourself out of the tribe years ago. Now, don't you fool yourself into believing you were driven out by force. You're right, of course. I don't know what gets into me. That's better. Now, what comes next? You started a new book? Oh, look. Look around you. Papers, ledgers, notebooks. Thousands of words, hundreds of ideas, dozens of scenes, but no book. Time's getting away from me. Gets away before I even know it's gone. Time. Seems to me you've used your time pretty well. Oh, no, I haven't. You know the only reason I've done all this work? It's because I'm so confounded lazy. Lazy? Plain lazy. I keep working because I'm afraid to stop. Because it's such hard work getting started again. I'll bet you anything. All these fellas who are supposed to be such hard workers are just the same... You take old Thomas Edison, pretending he works all the time because he likes it. You don't believe that? I do not. I bet he wishes he could stay in bed every day until 2 o'clock and then go on down to the pool hall. Then what keeps him from it? Every time he wants to lie in bed until 2 o'clock, he hears the voice of his old man. His father? Why, he's been dead for years. Well, that doesn't matter. He still hears him. Just as he's rolling over to get an extra hour or two, I'll bet he hears old Pa Edison hollering from the foot of the stairs, telling him to get up, and he's not worth power enough to blow him sky high. That <laughs> They were all the same. They were always poor orphans, and school was always six miles away, and it was always snowing. George, that's why you get up, because you're afraid not to. That's how it'll be with me for the rest of my life. Every time I dream of tropic isles and plucking breadfruit from the trees, I'll hear the voice of the old man. Thus, conscience stuff make cowards of us all. I'm lazy. But every time I surrender to my baser self, the old man hollers from the stairs. <laughs> In the end, I had to have fame. And I had her, as she may be had. Only to discover that fame, like love, was not enough. At last, the circle went full swing. The cycle drew to its full close. The world came in. And there was something in the world and in my heart that I had not known was there. I had gone back for rest, for oblivion, to that land which of all foreign lands I loved the best. And I walked at morning through the Brandenburger Tor. Oh, I've never had such a holiday, Heinrich. The whole city seems to be filled with music. And all for me. For you and for the Olympic Games, my friend. But I ask you... Is there anything on earth like Berlin in May? Nothing. <laughs> it is so fortunate that you came here. Germany loved your books before, but now she has taken you to her heart. And the sales, the sales. Never has my publishing house known anything so wonderful. <laughs> Wait. Eh? What's that? 
Oh, George, uh, coming along the street there, looks like some kind of parade. Ah, no, 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 it is not a parade. You will see them every day. Those are the fine boys of the Wehrmacht. Hmm. Look at their fine, straight backs. Ah, have you ever seen anything so brave? He saw the uniforms of olive green, the smacking, booted feet, the young faces shaded under iron helmets. But the people were making holiday, and Berlin was glorious. And this could not be sinister or bad. What a crowd, Franz. I think the Olympics have turned out the whole city. <laughs> the whole country, George. Myself, I would not come, but you should see how it goes. Well, why wouldn't you come? I've never seen such pageantry. That is it. Myself, I do not like these demonstrations that these fools are making. Are they fools? They've built a stadium such as the world has never seen. Oh, yes. And they will be building more things that the world has never seen. And some that the world will not like. Well, what's the matter? Why does everything stop? What's going to happen now? It means that this leader is coming now, this Führer. You had better stand up when everyone else does, George. You are an American, but you had better stand up. He saw that everything had been planned for this moment, for this triumphant purpose. It all went beyond anything the games themselves demanded. But the games were thrilling... And this could not be bad. Are you happy, my George? Happy? Oh, Elsa, darling, I've never known such glorious happiness in all my life. I want you to be happy. I love you, George. I seem to have come home to something here. I've known so many years of wandering in exile. Now I've come home to Germany. And to you... George, you will always be lonely, perhaps. You are an artist. The artist is a religious man, and he's lonely. But perhaps not so much now. Uh, Elsa, is anything the matter? You seem worried about no, something. No, no, nothing. We will not talk about it. You're, yes, we will. Uh, what's the trouble? No trouble, not with me. It, it was a friend of my family. They came and got him last night. They? The police. Well, what for? They do not say. They never say. George, it, it happens to so many. It is better not to talk. Something was happening to him. It came to him in whispers, in phrases, in looks of fear and smiling faces that hid despair. He saw an entire nation infested with the contagion of an ever-present fear, silenced into a malignant secrecy. They had become spiritually septic with the distillations of their own self-poisons, for which now there was no medicine or release. So, George... You are really going? Oh, I must, Franz. I've missed two boats already. I can't miss another one. But you will come back. We do so love you here. I hope I'll come back, Franz. Oh, you must come back. And someday, you must write a bitter book and tell all these fools where they belong. Only you must not say things that will make these people angry with you. What kind of things? Those things about politics, about the party. You must not say them yet. It would be quite dreadful if you did. Why would it? Because you have the best name now of any foreign writer. The people love you. And if you write things to make the party angry, we will not be able to get your books anymore or read them. In France, a man must write what he must write. Then, if you had to say some things about the party, you would say them? Yes. Even if it meant that we could no longer read what you write, and if you could never come back here... Yes, even if they told me that. Then I will tell you something. You are one big fool. You have a great name here. You are a famous writer. 
these bloody little politicians. They do not matter. The only thing I care about is what these dreadful fools will do to Germany, to the people. You do like the people, George. Yes. Yes, you must, of course. They are a good lot. They are big fools, but they are not too bad. Well, you must do what you must do, but you are one big fool. Come on, George. It is time to go. The lonely, level land stroked past. The flat land, and then the solitude of the forest and the dusk beneath the kefern trees. And inside the compartment, three people. Three ordinary people. Oh, pardon me, Gnevke Frau. Would it disturb you if I were to smoke? Oh, certainly not. You'll pardon, mine here. You can see the sign there. It says quite plainly, no smoking. Oh, yes, of course I've seen it. In that case, Oh, I it makes won't... no difference to me. Please smoke. I wished only to point out that the sign was there. <laughs> <laughs> you are an American, I believe. Yes, I'm on my way home. Weber is my name, George Weber. Ah, you are the famous writer. I've heard of you. Allow me to present myself, Herr Horst. I am delighted to meet you, Herr Weber. My name is Frau Morgan. Have you been in Germany long? All summer. You are so fortunate, you Americans. It is so difficult for a German citizen to travel anywhere. <laughs> difficult enough for me. I have so many papers and passes, I can't keep track of them. Oh, it is almost too complicated. I, I am a lawyer. I once had many activities outside Germany. Now, they are impossible. How soon will we come to the Belgian border? I'm anxious to reach Paris. And so am I. There's an international congress of lawyers. It is my first trip outside of Germany in many months. We should be at Aachen on the Belgian border almost any minute. Oh, then there will be all the passes and the stamps and everything to show. Oh, of course, it is necessary. It is all very necessary. I am a good German citizen. I, I do not wish to say anything. I have said nothing, nothing at all. Nevertheless, it, it is difficult. And since one can take out only ten marks, how is one to get along in Paris? How, indeed? Uh, I have an idea. I'm allowed to take 23 marks, you know, but I've spent it all. Uh, perhaps I could help you. You mean you would take some of our money? Yes. Oh, but that would be wonderful. Oh, you are very kind here, Weber. Have you more money than you're allowed to take out? I have, of course. If, if you would take ten of Allow mine... me, please. I will give, give Herr Weber ten marks. Of yours, Frau Morgan, he will take thirteen. Well, you better make up your minds. We're slowing down. This must be Aachen. Yes, yes. Here are the thirteen marks. And here are ten of mine. Give them to me. The pass control, they are so strict. They ask so many questions. Really, I'm quite nervous. Uh, uh, put away the money, Herr Weber, quickly. All right, I need safe. I, I wonder if you would be so kind as to change seats with me, Herr Weber. I, I have weak eyes. The light from the window is very disturbing to me. Well, it's nearly dark, but certainly. Just sit over here. Achtung, pass control. Present your papers. Your name? Weber, George. Hmm. Everything in order? Oh, wait a bit. You have a certificate showing re-entrance into Germany from Kufstein. There is a certificate from Kufstein. Well, I'm, I'm sure I had one. It, it must be in there someplace. Ah? Uh, uh, so... I found it. Very well. Your money? Twenty-three marks. So, next. Your name? Anna Morgan. Your destination? Paris. For how long? Three days. So, your papers are in order. Your money? I have uh, 42 marks. That is illegal, as you know. You will hand over all in excess of ten. Naturally, the money will be held and returned to you. So, thank you. Next. Your name? Uh... Adolf Horst. Your destination? Paris. For how long? A week. Your money? Uh, ten marks. So? Tell me, Herr Horst, how do you expect to remain in Paris for a week with only ten marks? Why, I... Answer! How do you expect to remain in Paris for a week with only ten marks? I, why, I, I believe I, I may have perhaps another twenty. Uh, yes, I forgot. I do have another twenty somewhere. And how much more? Uh, how much more, Jew? Uh, here now. Quiet! Uh, you, open your baggage. Uh, there is some air. My name is Adolf Horst. You, you can see my papers. They are in order. I am going to the International Congress of Lawyers. There is some air. Enough. And, on your feet. But you must let me... Out! Get out! Move! Uh, so! Now move. 
Your pardon, Herr Weber, for a moment. I regret this incident. You're not going to let him go. You're, you're going to keep him here? Naturally. I'll hit her. Oh, this man. Why, the... the oh, no, it is necessary. They all try to get out with their money. Money? Well, I've got to go after him. After him? Are you mad? Oh, here's ten marks. I've got his money. Sit down. He is in enough trouble already. Do you want him to keep you, too? You must not be upset. You look so troubled. Well, I feel as if I were carrying blood money. Not blood money. Jew money. They are taking out millions of marks. You foreigners, you just don't understand. He... Poor man. He must have wanted very badly to escape. Yes. Uh, are we in Belgium now? Yes. Do not misunderstand me. I am a German. I love my country, but... But it is so good to be out. And George, too, was out. Out of that country which had meant more to him than land, so much more than place. It was the other part of his heart's home... The dark, lost Helen that had been forever burning in his blood. He knew the priceless measure of his loss, but also of his gain. For he saw finally that you can't go home again. That there was no road back. Therefore, old master, wizard, Faust, old father of the ancient and swarm-haunted mind of man... Old earth, old German land with all the measure of your truth, your glory, beauty, magic, and your ruin. And dark Helen burning in our blood, great queen and mistress. Dark land, dark land, old ancient earth I love. Farewell. The world came in. And in this far place, I realized for the first time how sick we are, all of us, with a dread world sickness of the soul. But yet I have this to tell you, Fox. Man was born to live, to suffer, and to die, and what befalls him is a tragic lot. There is no denying this in the final end. But we must deny it all along the way. Mankind was fashioned for eternity, but man is fashioned for a day. He must believe that man's life can be and will be better, that man's enemies, fear, hatred, slavery, cruelty, poverty, and need, can be conquered and destroyed. For us, the living, we must speak, and speak the truth, as much of it as we can see and know. With the courage of the truth within us, we shall meet the enemies as they come to us, and they shall be ours. And if, once having conquered them, new enemies approach, we shall meet them from that point, from there proceed. In the affirmation of that fact, the continuance of that unceasing war, is man's religion and his living faith. You have been listening to You Can't Go Home Again, an NBC theater production of the Thomas Wolfe novel. If you wish to increase your knowledge and appreciation of literature, we suggest you might enjoy the college-supervised courses now being offered in connection with the NBC theater. For full information, write to NBC Theater in care of one of the following universities or colleges. The University of Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky. The University of Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Kansas State Teachers College, Pittsburgh, Kansas, Washington State College, Pullman, Washington, the University of Arizona, Tucson, Arizona, Texas College of Arts and Industries, Kingsville, Texas, Brooklyn College, Brooklyn, New York. You also have a chance to win a set of the famous Encyclopedia Britannica. Several of the universities and colleges offering these courses are giving the Encyclopedia 
as prizes to the students doing the best work. Enroll in a supervised course, and you may be one of the fortunate ones to win the Encyclopedia Britannica. Next week, the NBC Theater gives place to a special Christmas Day broadcast from the Vatican. We return again the following week with a New Year's Day production of Charles Dickens' Great Expectations. You Can't Go Home Again was adapted for the NBC Theater by Clarice A. Ross. Marvin Miller was George, Ted Von Eltz, Wolf. Mr. Piva was Mayor Kennedy. Polly Bear was Judge Bland. William Lally, Randy. Frank Gerstel was Sam. Lois Kibbe, Margaret. Michael Ann Barrett was Esther. Bruce Payne was John. Jerry Hausner, Herbert. Jeff Corey was McNabb. Lester Sharp, Heilig. Lillian Bayef, Elsa. Naomi Stevens, Frau Morgan. Jan Arvan was Horst. And David Wolf, the official. Your announcer, Don Stanley. Our intermission commentator was Norman Cousins, whose commentary was recorded. The director of the NBC Theater is Andrew C. Love. This program came to you from Hollywood. What's on NBC today? Comedy by Phil Harris and Alice Fay, and Mystery by Sam Spade are yours for the listening today on NBC. You'll hear Phil Harris demonstrate how not to get a Christmas tree, and Sam Spade will tell you the whispering death caper. Now, hear America's favorite, One Man's Family. Stay tuned to NBC. NBC.